in the Department of Special Education, well, I should say in the Department of Educational Psychology in the Program of Special Education. And I don't want to spend much of our time introducing myself, but just so I have a little bit of credibility with you, I've been in academia for about 20 years now, first in Utah Brigham Young University, and then um, I joined the U of M campus about four years ago. I have had the privilege of affiliating with the Minnesota PBIS project now for the past four years. And I don't know if you all know, but I'm gonna tout their names here, but they were just acknowledged by the Commissioner of Education in the trip. So hooray for PBIS in Minnesota and all the great work that that team does. So I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I've also done a lot of research and worked both here and in Utah with positive behavior support. And I hope that some of what I have to share with you will be meaningful. My purpose today is to have you leave with some resources. And I'll just tell you that in addition to being in higher education, I've also been a public school teacher and a mother, a stepmother actually, and um, an aunt and sister of many children. So I do have a little experience with kids and behaviors, including challenging behaviors. So to get started, I'm going to share my screen and start off my PowerPoint. Can you see that, Erin? Great. So you can see that what, oh wait, this is not showing. Um, hold on just a minute. I wanna make sure you can see this right. Is it cutting off the slide a little bit? You can probably, can you just um, maximize your screen or hit full screen? Okay, that did it on that screen. That's not what I wanted. Let's try one more time. Okay, I hope that's working. Okay. That's perfect, you got it. Right. We'll move forward here. So I want to start off by sharing a little bit about research and some of the things that will set the stage for our discussion. You can see that I've quoted a few people or referenced a few people here about what research are saying with respect to classroom management and that it's important to be preventive rather than reactive. I wanted to share with you that it's vital that schools ensure systematic instruction in social behavior. Too often children are referred for evaluation and more intensive resources of support before simple behavior supports and good teaching practices have been applied consistently, similar to what happens in academics. And also, um, we often select and implement evidence-based practices to promote appropriate social behavior and this is tantamount to increase children's opportunities for success and the likelihood that they will receive positive reinforcement in the school setting. So moving forward, I think most of you that are in the audience today, and if we were sitting at the MDE, I would make this so much more interactive, even though my world for the past few months, as well as your world, has been remote. Um, I would ask you to share with me your backgrounds, but since I can't see you all, I'll just assume that many of you know what school-wide positive behavior support is. And you can see from these references, one from Horner, who's one of the grandfathers of positive behavior support, is that emphasis should be placed on ongoing monitoring of student behavior and early interventions. And that primary prevention tier, so that's the bottom of the triangle, the green part typically, involves teaching, monitoring, and acknowledging behavioral expectations for all children and implementing evidence-based practices. So what does that mean for teachers? 
So you can see I have a few references here about making sure that teachers establish learning environments that develop or sustain behavior, um, lack of behavior problems, um, that also we have inadequate teacher preparation that hinders successful early intervention and response to intervention efforts, and that a lot of times we're missing out when it comes to behavior management. So I will just tell you that one of the things the research really shares with us is that the challenging behavior problems lead to teacher burnout. And so it's one of the top reasons that teachers leave the field. So when we think about multi-tier systems of support and positive behavior support being a subunit of that, we can see that there's a lot of pieces to that. So I've listed some key bullet points. Um, we need to include evidence-based interventions, multi-tiered intervention models, screening, assessment and progress monitoring, administering of interventions with a high degree of integrity, also known as fidelity. We need to make sure that we support and coordinate efforts across all levels of staff and leadership within the school. And I would say, within all units um, and what just got shared in the trib shows that our state is really leading out on making sure that there's collaboration between districts schools and the higher state level and that is so critical and then of course we want to make sure that we have sustaining systems of prevention that are well grounded in mtss framework um, and multi-tier systems of support so how do we make sure that all that research that I just shared, a little, little pocket of it, <laughs> turns into practice? You can see from this particular slide that we start with research, with those things that I was just talking about, and we make sure we train. And one of the things that I do, or I try to do at the university level, is make sure that that's done at the pre-service level. We know that that isn't done in all programs, but I have tried to make sure that that's done both with general and special education teachers. Well, then we also know that we need professional development um, for current professionals. So that would be you folks, those of you that are in the field, that are in schools, making sure that there's ongoing training. And that when we do that, then we take research into training and then we support implementation with fidelity. And that also ensures not only implementation with fidelity, but also sustainability. So the effective training within multi-tier systems of support includes, as you can see, I've, I've chosen to design this into four places, four pockets. We have interdisciplinary, so that includes, as I was saying, all sorts of educators. <clears throat> research-based interventions, which is going to be a lot of what we talk about today, database decision-making, so we identify and then we continue to monitor progress and programs, and then progress monitoring with respect to interventions. And that then supports targeted coursework, or in your case, um, ongoing seminars and workshops and other ways that we support schools as well as what we do in the field. So given that current emphasis on improving outcomes for all students, it is imperative that all educators receive access to evidence-based strategies and training materials that are appropriate to meeting a wide range of student needs. So my discussion with you today is not just going to be for those kids that are at risk or that have been identified. It's for all kids because these evidence-based practices work for all kids and we need to make sure all kids receive them. So the purpose behind what I am going to do today is share prevention and intervention evidence resources and materials to support behavioral, social, and emotional needs of all children and youth, including those with disabilities. And I'll just note that these resources are primarily for schools and parents, but that doesn't mean for those of you that are housed in other areas of our community that they can't be useful to you. But I just want you to know that that's my background and my frame of reference, so that's where I'm drawing from. And Mary Hunt, who I've been working with, asked that I share things that parents could also use, especially those of you that are being educators and parents at home these days, and who knows how long that's going to last. 
So here's my areas of focus today. We're going to talk about classroom management and engineering, positive relationships and feedback and praise, social and emotional learning, self-monitoring, functional behavioral assessments and behavior intervention plans, prevention and intervention strategies for problem behaviors, and then just some miscellaneous resources. There is no way I can show everything to you today that I am aware of. So what I'm going to do is try to empower you to have access to information and give you a taste of some of the key things that are out there. Um, I believe the PowerPoint has been shared with you, right, Erin? And all of these have links. And so as I share some of these things with you, the beauty of my PowerPoint is that I'm giving you access to resources, most of which are free. Some of which will cost, but most of which are free. So moving forward with classroom management and engineering. <clears throat> I'm going to first start by sharing with you an IRIS module. So IRIS is actually a free website that comes out of Vanderbilt. I just want to tell you that anything at IRIS is free. It is public domain and it is an amazing resource. It has grown and grown over the years. It continues to grow every year. It has been a great resource for me for teaching and so many things. So today I'm going to show you a plethora of things from Iris. You're going to get a taste of how many great things there are. So the first piece is there are two Iris modules that actually support designing classroom management plans. I'm going to show you the second one. Number one and number two that I have linked here both give you the basics of setting up a classroom management plan. But number two is designed so that if you walk through the module, which would take you um, about an hour to hour and a half to two hours, it actually has you design your own classroom management plan. So that might be valuable to you, or it might be valuable to some of the staff or parents that you're working with. So here we go. So this is the module, and you're going to see other modules that I show you today. They start off with a challenge and an initial thought, and then they go into perspectives and resources. I'm going to jump right into the perspectives and resources. And what you will see is it has objectives, and then I'm going to click on to next. And then it starts talking through various um, it, points of information. So page one talks about the effects of disruptive behavior. It gives you research and you can see that it has videos and then some other information on this page. As I go into page two, it talks about cultural influences on behavior. You'll see that it then has a lot of information about that with some handy dandy drop downs. It then has some activities that you can click into and some videos and then another activity. I'm showing you that so that you can get the feel of what these modules are like. Then the next page talks about classroom and teacher influences on behavior. It talks about organizing the classroom, creating a daily schedule, queuing transitions, and then you can see it has these key points about redirecting, planned, ignoring, and so forth. Again, more videos. And then we move forward and it gives you an introduction to developing a comprehensive behavior management plan. It gives you some of the key components of that and then it has another video. And actually that's an audio, excuse me. Then it tells you the components of a comprehensive behavior management plan. Again, it is supported by research, and I will tell you that all of the research in IRIS specifically comes from very well supported research out of the Utah or Utah, um, the United States Office of Education or the CDC. It's very well founded research. Then it goes on to have a few more video clips. And then it has you develop a statement of purpose. So if you were in this module, you would then look at well, they describe developing a statement of purpose, and then they actually have you do an activity that has you develop your own statement of purpose. And they actually have you type it right into 
the module, they have a, a document set up where you type it out so that you now capture your statement of purpose based on what they've taught you. Then the next step is they move you on to rules and they have examples of what rules should consist of in a classroom. They give you information again from research, they give you examples, and then the next step is they have you develop your own rules. And again, they have you type right into the document. Then they teach you about procedures. So specifically procedures for um, going into a transition or going down the hallway, just various things like that. Then they have elementary, middle school, and high school examples, which is wonderful. And then again, they have an activity for you so that you can develop your own procedures. They then move in to give you, you some general information about consequences. And this is always a good reminder. They talk about making sure they're clear and specific and that there's a process of intensity and hierarchy. <clears throat> then they move you into positive consequences. You can see that they have three types, tangible, social, and activity types. Again, some audio clips. And then they move you into negative consequences. And they teach you about the hierarchy. They have examples for elementary and secondary. They have information about delivering consequences. And then they have you develop what they call an action plan. They have you develop a toolkit, how you teach the plan to the students, how you share the plan with others, and how you will review the plan regularly. And you can see that then they've given you a really nice graphic, a table down here to help you with that. Um, I'm not going to show you that because I'm going to share it in just a moment. At the end of every module in IRIS, they have amazing references. And this is often a resource for me that I go into so that I can then find other resources that will support some of the efforts that I'm doing, whether it be working with my teacher candidates or if I'm doing research with a the school, they have books, they have online resources. So that is one of the modules that I wanted to share with you today. Again, there's a second one. You can see there's an early childhood module. Then one of the other things that IRIS has that I really value is they have what they call case studies and star sheets. So I'm going to go into this, star, this case study and star sheet and I want to share with you what those consist of. There are many of these. This just happens to be about norms and expectations. So because I train teachers, I like the case studies. That may or may not be useful to you. Perhaps you would be doing a seminar or a workshop and you might find these case studies valuable. And I will just let you know that these case studies have a nice breadth. They cover ages. Um, they often cover individuals and groups. Um, they often cover students with and without disabilities. And then after the case studies, they have what they call star sheets. So you can see on this one, it states expectations clearly as the topic. Implementing classroom rules and procedures. You can see at the end of every star sheet, there's resources. Guidelines for writing rules. Supporting expectations consistently. Reevaluating established norms. So that's what the star sheets consist of. <laughs> You can see on my PowerPoint here, I have another one that I've um, linked for you, and it's about how to set up a, cl a classroom. Um, that is so important to be effective in a classroom. I won't go into that one now, but if you wanted to brush up on how to set up an effective classroom, it gives you all sorts of different ways to set up a classroom based on different scenarios and contexts. It's again, another great way you could teach people if you were needing to help them to learn. I showed you um, the game briefly when we were in the last module. I would like to show you this behavior game just briefly. There are two pieces of it. 
this would be connected to consequences. So one of them talks about positive and negative consequences. The other is a game that's called consequence hierarchy. I'm just going to go into this first one and give you a taste of how this works. <clears throat> So what it tells you is you're going to determine whether consequence is positive, negative, or inappropriate. And it says to win, you get 16 apples before getting four worms. And there's also a help. Is that too loud? Nope, it's good. Okay. Okay, so we're going to deal the cards. So Aaron, I'm going to have you tell me, do you think praise is appropriate? inappropriate, or I can't remember what this one was. <laughs> Positive, negative, or inappropriate is I think what they said. Erin, what do you think it is? I'm gonna go with appropriate. Okay. Correct. So it tells us it's correct, and then I'm gonna let you listen to that. Praise is a positive consequence. This simple and cost-free consequence is probably underutilized. Teachers should take care, however, to assess individual students to better judge what their reaction to praise is likely to be. So then it puts it up there and then you deal again. Negative phone call home. And you get the idea. I'm not going to do any more for sake of time. But this is a great game um, that helps you to teach positive and negative consequences. I think you'd be surprised how much you've learned. I've been teaching this for over two decades and I still learn things. And then the other one I told you about is the hierarchy of positive and negative consequences. Okay. So then to finish up, I wanted to also show you how many of you, well, I won't ask that. If I could see your hands, I would ask you if you're familiar with the teaching channel. It is one of my favorite websites. So I'm going to go into showing you what the teaching channel consists of. It's a great resource that has a video library, catalog, blog, it has partnership information. Today, I'd like to show you briefly one of the videos off of the teaching channel. This is a great way to learn information and share information. This one happens to be New Teacher Survival Guide Classroom Management. year teacher at the Urban Assembly School for Applied Math and Science in the Bronx. I grew up in Massachusetts in a really small town. I knew I loved working with kids and, and there's just so much I think that needs to be done. Lilia teaches social studies and language arts to sixth graders. It's a very kind of heterogeneous class I guess you could say with many different students on very different levels with various needs. When everything is going perfectly in a class, I can't think of a better job in the world. Um, but when it's not going well, it's probably the most exhausting, frustrating thing I've ever done. One of Lilia's biggest challenges is maintaining control of her class when student animosities erupt. A lot of students just have a lot of trouble interacting with each other positively. Really getting them to focus and use that energy the way they need to has been the biggest challenge. Lilia has also noticed that student behavior deteriorates during test prep. They've done test prep for a couple years in their other classes and their other schools, so um, they feel like they've already been there, done that, and they're bored by it. Sar, let's keep it going. You're almost there. Today, Lilia is traveling to Columbia University's Teachers College in Manhattan to get some expert advice on classroom management. How are you? Hi, Hi. It's good to meet nice you. Nice to meet you as well. Come on in. Thank you. She's meeting with Jackie Anses, a 30-year veteran of the New York City Public Schools. Classroom management is not an end in itself. It's to set up an orderly uh, and safe space so that the kids can learn what it is that you want them to learn. Lilia has brought a video of her test prep unit for Jackie to review. 
so this is my humanities class. It meets for 97 minutes um, from just after the students have lunch. And is this their first year in the school? Yes, it is. They're all brand new to the school, along with me. <laughs> in any new classroom, the first step is to establish routines so the students know exactly what is expected of them. Kids have to know where they sit. They have to know what the routine is, that you come into the classroom, you sit down, you open your book, you do the assignment that's on the board, you have just so many minutes to do it. You're not in a situation where you're waiting for the kids to get quiet to start the lesson. The lesson starts the minute they set foot in the door. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening in your classroom. Okay, great. Um, this was a day where they were doing a listening section. I read a passage out loud twice, they took notes, and then they were responding to that. You have two pages of notes, so flip open to the first page so you can see exactly where you'll be taking notes. Lilia begins by sharing the classroom management yep. strategies she has found most useful. I'm all over the place in that classroom. That's important for me just so I can constantly see what different students are doing. It's really important for me to feel like I can always keep tabs on students and also for them to realize that I'm not going to just leave them alone. I want to really set the tone that I'm there to help push them along. We're moving along together. She uses one-on-one -on -one strategies to target individual students. I found that whispering is really effective. It is a way to redirect students in a really private way. They don't feel conscious about being called out in front of the entire class, which means they're less likely to react negatively. Okay. So that gives you a taste of one of the videos, and there are so many more. I use many of them um, for my teaching, but I wanted you to get a feel. If you were to continue watching that, there would be more and more tips that you might be able to use or share with other people. To finish up this slide, you can see I've listed another video from the teaching channel. And like I said, there's many more. You can search by topics in the teaching channel. One of my absolute favorite books that I highly recommend for any of you that would want a book instead is Chance by Randy Scrick. Randy Scrick's Anything Behavior is worth looking at. One that is dated but is, to me, a gem is Keys to an Effective Classroom by Glenn Latham. I actually had the privilege of knowing him in my doctoral program. Would highly recommend that book. And then two others that I wanted to recommend are elementary and secondary books by Emmer and Evertson that are about classroom management. They're well supported by Iris as well. So that gives you a flavor for information about classroom management. I'm now going to move on to information, as you saw in my last slide, about positive relationships and feedback slash praise. So as you, um, no, I am very passionate about IRIS, and you can see here there are some IRIS case studies and star sheets about encouraging appropriate behavior. There is also, I want to show you another thing that IRIS has, and that is what we call fundamental, fundamental skill sheets. This one happens to be on behavior specific praise. Although we all know that term, as you heard previously it's often underused in our schools and it's very free and very readily available to you because you're the one that gives it so this skill sheet as you can see talks about what it is what do we know about this skill and practice the procedures tips for implementation things to keep in mind and then some implementation examples and then here's what's really sweet. Embedded into this skill sheet, you have an elementary example and a secondary example. We often find secondary examples get left out, right? And then there's, again, fabulous research and references. So that's what these fabulous skill sheets, these fundamental skill sheets are all about. And there are many of them that you will find on IRIS. I've already shown you the behavior game today. I just wanted to mention to you another video off of teaching channel that is very, way too long for me to show you, but it is my absolute favorite on teaching channel. It's how to develop a caring and, oh, excuse me, caring and control, create a safe, positive classroom. I'll just let you know that it's an interaction between a teacher and a gentleman who 
is well um, founded in coaching strategies. It is, again, one of my favorite things to watch. It's about 15 minutes long. So now moving along, I don't know how many of you are familiar with high leverage practices. I'm sure there's some of you that know about these. They have been developed out of the Council of Exceptional Children. They're called HLPs for short. I'm going to go into that website and show you the resources that are there, specifically some videos that are available to you. So high leverage practices in special education. There's information about the HLPs. There's K to 12 practices, as you can see. There's birth to five practices, as you can see. There's various resources and there's a bunch of videos and a professional development guide. You can see that here are some of those HLP video series. And I wanted to just click in and briefly show you this one so that you get a feel for what these are like. Simple praise and corrective feedback can be helpful to students. Oh, excuse me, I'll start it over. <laughs> We'll just watch two minutes of this. Welcome to our video for high leverage practice numbers 8 and 22. Provide positive and constructive feedback to guide students' learning and behavior. There are 22 high leverage practices for special education spread across four domains. Provide positive and constructive feedback to guide students' learning and behavior appears twice because of its dual implications for the social, emotional, behavioral, and instruction domains. This video is divided into two parts. In part one, we introduce and define positive and constructive feedback. In part two, we note four key components of this HLP and feature four teachers demonstrating examples. Part one, introduction and definitions. Human beings. Okay, so that gives you a taste of what um, occurs with respect to, hold on just a minute, um, with respect to the HLPs. The last thing I wanted to note on this slide is um, some things that I've been involved with through the years with respect to praise. I'm a real advocate of praise. I've seen it make a real difference in the lives of children and youth. And I have a couple of resources here that if you'd like to learn more about what I call praise notes and how I've used those. Those are kind of like tickets that you give out. You can learn some things about those. So now we're going to talk about social and emotional learning resources. So I have another website that I'd like to share with you. That's called Edutopia. So Edutopia has various topics, as you can see that I have now on the screen. It has various videos, and you can see it describes its mission. I'd like to show you for a minute, um, actually for a few minutes, a video that introduces you to SELs. It's called Five Keys to Successful Social and Emotional Learning. I hope some of you have found the power of social and emotional learning as you've learned more about positive behavior support. <clears throat> Social and emotional skills are the essential skills for success in school, work, and life.
social emotional learning centers their mind and body. It reduces their emotional tension so they can be open to new content and material. We find that academic outcomes increase exponentially when students are nurtured, loved, and cared for, that we get much more out of them when we first address social emotional needs. So for us, it's actually an academic intervention and not just an emotional one. If we expect students to be college and career ready, it's important for us to focus on these skills and competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Okay, and then I'm gonna forward it. I wanna just show you the very end of this. Video. It's important for teachers and principals to understand that it can't be a binder off the shelf. It can't be something that happens from 2.15 to 4.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It has to be part of the school culture. Giving teachers flexibility, giving them a range of skills, giving them different ways that it can look, and allow them to take their own personality and match that to what they want in their classroom has been the best way to get authentic, true practice. If we continue to do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we always got. Is that good enough? I don't think it's good enough for the 21st century. We need to be the outliers to try things that have never been tried and see if they work. What are we waiting for? I just want to add, um, they referenced an, uh, an article in that video from Durlock that I highly recommend. I'm a real proponent of SEL, and I'll just say that I was delighted to see our Commissioner of Education in the state be an advocate of positive behavior support in light of the things that have happened in our country. I'll just tell you that I believe SEL is one of the answers to solving some of those issues. Not all the issues, but some of them. Okay, and then I wanted to also mention another website. It's the Center on Social and Emotional Learning Foundations for Early Learning. So now I'm mindful of those of you that are in the early childhood area. There are so many resources here. I wanted to note that there are some family tools, there's training kits, there's modules. So it'd be well worth your time if you're in the early learning area to explore this particular website. Again, Another um, set of resources from my background called Book in the Bag. It's taking social skills and using books to actually teach social skills. Those resources might be of interest to you. Something else that I wanted to advocate for are the skill streaming books by Goldstein. You can see that there are three. There's early childhood, elementary, and adolescent. I'm going to choose to click into the adolescent one because I think we don't do enough for adolescents. And you'll see that this is skill streaming the adolescent, new strategies and perspectives for teaching pro-social skills by Goldstein and McGinnis. And just like you see that for the adolescent, there's one for elementary and one for early childhood. It is one of my favorite ways and one of the best research ways for teaching social skills. So those are the resources for social and emotional learning and social skills. Now we're going to talk about functional behavioral assessment and behavior intervention plans. I have two resources to share with you today. One of them is another IRIS module. I use this, I train um, both elementary and special ed teachers in functional behavioral assessments every semester at the University of Minnesota. I've been training in that area for many years. This um, resource is fairly new in the past, I'd say seven or so years, and it just keeps getting better. In fact, as I prepared for today, I discovered they'd added some new things. So again, they have a challenge and an initial thought, and then you go into the perspectives and resources. 
and they start teaching you about functional behavioral assessment. They talk about understanding behavior. And again, there's videos, there's activities. They learn into, they go into learning key behavior principles. These will be familiar to you. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, and so forth. And then it moves into applying behavior principles. It talks about the ABCs of behavior. It has some really great examples, has an expert by the name of Kathleen Lane, who is a friend of mine. I highly recommend her information. It has a really great activity. So for those of you that are brushing up on your FBAs and BIPs or you're training on them, this module is great. It talks about conducting an FBA, identifying and defining problem and replacement behaviors. And throughout all of these, there's videos, there's audio clips, there's activities. And it tells you about collecting what we call indirect assessments. And then we go into collecting direct observations. And it actually gives you videos where you can practice gives you information about ways to collect data. And then it talks about identifying the function of the behavior. And I will just note that this matrix right here is one of the best things that's ever been designed. Been designed by a man by the name of John Umbright. And it helps you identify the function better than anything I know out there. Has an activity that goes with that. And then it leads you into designing function-based interventions, which is tricky. And it gives you some really good scenarios and examples so that you can practice and be more equipped. It gives you an activity. And then moving forward, it talks about maximizing intervention success with your actual intervention, how to inter implement the intervention, and then evaluating the intervention and then true to form, it concludes with resources. So that is one FBA resource. And I just wanted to note that it has some supporting um, resources in IRIS that I highly value. These are called IRIS activities, ABC analysis, interval frequency recording, and latency duration recording. Each one of these has scenarios and videos built in as well as forms to allow you to practice either by yourself or with your team. Oh, excuse me. The other FBA resource I wanted to share with you today is one that the MDE is actually very familiar with. Um, interestingly enough, when I discovered it, they had just discovered it as well. I wanted to just start by sharing with you that this comes out of Portland State University, but is also connected with Kansas, two really good universities, I might note. And I wanted to show you that they have what we call learning modules. They have modules for school-wide training. They would have each school do two of the modules. Excuse me, it didn't quite click up in time. So they have a module about understanding behavior and function-based intervention. And then they have one for those that are, want to be behavior specialists. And I'll just tell you that I find this to be an amazing resource that has really helped me to hone my school skills even better in the past few years. You can see as I browse through them, the names of the modules how appropriate they are, and how thorough they are. Um, this has just been a great resource for me. They also share their forms with you, how to put it into effective use, and then this gives you the overview. Um, I will just say again, this, both the IRIS module and this resource from Portland State have become one of my favorite training resources for functional behavior assessment. I've used many things in my teaching, trainings, and consulting work. And the last area I wanted to share with you is about prevention and intervention strategies. So I'm going to just briefly mention that one of my favorite strategies out there is about self-monitoring. 
Um, I believe the whole reason we use behavior management strategies or functional behavioral assessment or any of the other things I've exposed you to today is to help kids to monitor their own behavior. Ultimately, that's what we want our children and youth to do, right, is manage their own behavior. So I am sharing with you three resources today to help that happen. One is an IRIS module called SOS, one of my very favorite IRIS modules, I might add. Fostering accountability, case studies, and star sheets. And then the last one is a video about self-monitoring. Sorry, I can't seem to get past that. Then some other resources about interventions that I wanted to mention to you. People often ask me, okay, Michelle, you've given me a lot of information about preventing behavior and about how to build positive behavior. And I believe that's the crux of what we should be doing in our classrooms and schools. But I am not naive. I do know we have kids with problem behaviors. And so I am going to give you a couple of resources today that will help you with that as well. I have two IRIS modules here. The they are addressing non-compliant and disruptive behavior. So I thought I'd just briefly click into those and share with you what they are about. This module is about understanding what we call the acting out cycle. So if you wanna learn more about why kids act out and how to manage that, this module is for you. The other IRIS module about addressing non-compliant and disruptive behavior is titled just that, Addressing Disruptive and Non-Compliant Behaviors and Behavioral Interventions. So if you were to go into this module and dig deeper, you would see, I'm just gonna actually go through the menu right here, that it talks about high probability requests, choice making, differential reinforcement, eliminating behaviors using DRO, DRL and DRI. So if you wanted to learn some strategies to deal with non-compliant and disruptive behaviors, this module is for you. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint now and then mention, I didn't label this correctly, but it's the IRIS Fundamental Skill Sheet. So just like the one I showed you earlier that was specific to praise, there are fundamental skill sheets on choice making, high probability requests, and proximity control. And I'll just briefly click into one so that you can see yet again that it defines it, talks about what we know, about procedures, things to keep in mind, implementation examples, and a video example. So again, these are strategies, going back to this slide, about prevention and intervention strategies. And you can click into these right off of the PowerPoint that's been shared with you today. So to finish up today and to allow some time for a few questions, I wanted to mention a few other resources that I highly value. Because you live in Minnesota, you're probably well aware of PACERS. PACERS is specifically there for parents, but it is a great way for parents and professionals to collaborate. Um, a firm is something I've learned actually from my colleague here, Erin, and a few others. A great resource for those that you, uh, of you that work with autism spectrum disorder individuals that are on the spectrum. Um, I would also note this is a great resource for parents. And overall, it's just good for kids at large. Um, it has a lot of materials, particularly modules that are amazing and well researched. This is a PBIS um, resource that's a national PBIS website that has a plethora of resources in it, some of which are for families and a lot of which are for schools. CASEL is another social and emotional learning website that is well supported and documented. Um, I highly recommend it. This is a newer website. Nietzsche has put out behavior support for intensive interventions. I have not had time to explore it thoroughly, but what I have found in there are many documents, um, papers, videos, activities, and modules that are well worth one's time for working with kids with behavior challenges. 
So those are websites that I highly recommend. And then I just wanted to briefly mention some books and materials that I also value. Um, one thing that I haven't shared a lot with today, but there are many information briefs on IRIS. And I wanted to click into that and show you that there are so many more things on IRIS than I have even had time to show you that I hope you'll just comb through it. But under each of these drop downs, you'll see that there are information briefs and they're just brief little ditties about various, um, let me go into the behavior one, about various, oh, excuse me, wrong one, um, about various sources of information. You can see that all of these would give you information about behavior. So those are information briefs from Iris. Another book that I highly recommend is by, again, Randy Sprick, who I have a great deal of respect for, is called The Behavior Encyclopedia. I have not been able to get back into my office due to COVID, where we've been asked not to go back except for an emergency. So I didn't warrant this as an emergency, but if you were to click into this, you would see Randy Sprick's very valuable Behavior Encyclopedia. What you do is you look up a behavior. So let's say you want to learn how to deal with um, non-compliance or with lying. You would open up that book, you'd look, it's done in alphabetical order, and then it gives you not just one, but multiple intervention strategies for the behavior that you're looking up. A fabulous resource worth every penny of the $75 you would pay for it. So that one's not free. For those of you that are struggling with parenting right now, my very favorite parenting book is called The Power of Positive Parenting. Glenn Latham has been dead now for whew, maybe 20 years, maybe 15, I can't remember. He raised eight children, was a great researcher, and he wrote this book, um, and it has a forward by Sydney Bijou. For those of you that are behaviorists, you'll remember that great name of behaviorism. And I have recommended this book to many people in my lifetime. It has wonderful um, pages where there's the margins have white in so you can write notes. The first six chapters gives you a great foundation and then it has topics like how to toilet train, how to talk to your teenager, how to deal with lying, how to deal with um, stealing. It's just a great book. I highly, highly recommend it. And you can see it's very cheap. It's $20. Whoops. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> and then, for those of you that don't know Glenn Latham, um, tough, the Tough Kid Book and Tough Kid Toolbox are another two fabulous resources. In every Utah school, you will find these resources. Um, Bill Jensen actually used to teach at the University of Utah, but was known internationally for his materials. So those are some of my favorite books and materials that I wanted to share with you today. Okay, so it looks like I have about seven minutes to answer questions. If there are people that would like to ask questions, Erin, is that allowed or not? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. You have the time. So now would be a great time for questions. Well, I don't at all want to impose any need for questions. I tried to make it through my PowerPoint quick enough so that I can allow for that if there were some. But my goal here today was merely to show you resources and give you a taste of what exists. I just want to close by saying, if schools attend to the emotional and behavioral needs of students on a broad scale, it is likely that they will create the conditions necessary for social competence and academic success of students. And you'll notice that I put both of those hand in hand, social competence and academic success, because they do indeed go together. 
here is my contact information. If you would like further information about anything I've shared today, I'm always happy to share. And I believe Erin's going to take it from here. Well, it looks like there's a lot of great, there's a lot of comments on um, the great resources. There was one question on what do you recommend for training of education assistants that work one on one with students? Um, out of everything that I've shared today, I think probably the thing I would encourage you to do the most is to ensure that they know the basic principles of behavior and managing behavior, particularly praise. So those would be the things that I've shared with you. I would definitely start off by teaching basic classroom management, even just one-on-one -on -one management skills, and then how to praise and redirect inappropriate behavior, starting off with praise and positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Whoa, the Randy Sprick book is $800 on Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, I do a little searching before I go that far. Yeah. <laughs> that amount. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, this was really, it's really wonderful to have you bring all of these amazing resources to so many people. Um, we're just really so excited um, that you were here today and sharing all of this information with us and um, and thank you for showing so many resources that are free and, and easily accessible. So we really appreciate everything you're doing for us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And to all of you, you're my heroes, especially those of you that are both teaching and parenting from home. This has been quite a journey for all of us. And my hat goes off to every single one of you. You're amazing people and you're doing good things, even if you feel like you aren't. Trust me, you are. I do see some concern about links and our amazing Garrett, who I have such respect for, says he's working on fixing the links. Garrett, if I can give you access to my non-PDF resource, let me know. I do have the PowerPoint in another format. Thank you. And everything um, will be, if it's not um, updated immediately right now, I know that Garrett will be um, showing um, or he will be updating that um, as well. Oh, this isn't. So I just wanted to put this up really quick. It's taking my view away from what I wanted to um, be able to show you, but um, just wanted to say thank you from everybody here um, at Minnesota PBIS and the Department of Education um, and put our uh, email up there again if you're looking for that at all. <clears throat> um, just mde.pbis at state.mn.us. Um, I'm actually going to stop my share because it is kind of um, uh, messing up my view for what I was trying to do here. So um, give me one second. Here we go. All right. So um, again, I just wanted to thank um, all of our presenters. So we'll just close everything for today here. Um, so we won't have a separate closing session, just as a reminder for everybody. But thank you to all of our presenters today. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody who has, who has helped out with um, these presentations. It's really wonderful to see all these great resources um, being shared. And it's really helpful to learn from all of these Minnesota implementation examples and see everything that we're, we're doing across the state. Um, and then relating all of those resources to our work is is just wonderful um, so we also just really want to kind of put a plug in um, to people who are participating be thinking about next year and um, and being presenters at summer institute as you can see it's wonderful when we have um, stories from our local implementers and their journeys so think about you know some ideas of of what you could present on your own um, journey next year and applying for exemplar school status. If your school is, um, is implementing um, and measuring fidelity and you're out of um, uh, cohort training, apply for exemplar school status. Um, uh, Michelle was just um, at the beginning of her presentation talking about all of the recognition that schools were getting across the state from that. Um, and we really wanna make sure that you know that that's something you can do and, um, and definitely um, apply for it and get that recognition as well. So hopefully,
um, you were able to see really a range of examples of how effective PBIS implementation can lead to all of these improved results that we're seeing. Um, and that this framework can be helpful for addressing issues related to equity, as well as all of these uncertain times and transition that we're seeing. We've had a lot of great examples that are really plugging things in to all of the um, issues that we're, we're all faced with right now, uh, whether it be distance learning um, or uh, making sure that we are really adapting everything to the school climate and culture um, and each individual student that we that we serve. So hopefully you have made some connections to that. I want to also say thank you to um, the planning committee, everybody that helped to put this together um, and those that really helped get this transition into this format so that we could do this virtual delivery. This was the first time we're doing this. Um, so hopefully as we're learning from, from this process um, moving forward, you know, we might, we um, can offer additional trainings um, and um, Summer Institute possibly as well next year in this format so that we're able to reach more people. Um, Again, thank you to PBIS Minnesota um, and all of the regional projects and trainers and coaches. We really appreciate all of the work that you do. Um, and again, consider, consider sharing your implementation successes and challenges with us because not everything um, is perfect. We know that it um, does not always go according to plan. So what are some of the barriers that you have um, come into contact with? And again, making sure that you're thinking about next year's Summer Institute or other professional developments that we might be offering throughout the year. Um, so just in closing, you know, thank you again, everybody. Um, good luck with your transitions as you're um, going back into whichever um, format of uh, learning delivery that we're going to be doing in the fall. Um, and we hope you find all of this helpful and supportive in that transition. So. That's all we have. Thank you very much, everybody.